Concorde was a feat of engineering that offered passengers the height of luxury commercial flight. But it was also a complete commercial failure. Just not for the reasons you're probably thinking. If you were alive between 1976 and 2003, then you might remember hearing the sound of this majestic machine flying overhead. It was so loud that everyone had to stop their conversations until it passed. And that wasn't even at its fastest speed. Had it flown over a populated area at its maximum speed of 1,354 miles per hour, then windows would have shattered from the airwaves. Traveling across the Atlantic Ocean in Concord took about three and a half hours. By comparison, a flight today from London to New York takes around eight hours. And Concord flew so high that you'd be able to see the Earth's curve and probably even a satellite passing by. Concord was prestigious, luxurious, godlike. It was too big to fail, yet it did. So what happened? How come commercial airlines no longer fly at supersonic speeds if it's quicker? Concorde's story starts in the mid-20th century. At the heart of the Cold War, the world's superpowers were jump-starting a technological arms race. Soviet Russia and its Western counterparts dumped hundreds of millions of dollars into projects, including the space race and supersonic aviation. In the end, it was the joint efforts of Britain and France that came out with their successful test flight of a supersonic commercial plane in 1969. And thus, the Concorde was born. But this was in the 60s, remember? Modern software wasn't around yet to automate design. Concorde was built with math on chalkboards by engineers in ties, working long hours to come up with unconventional ideas. For example, to help the pilots see during takeoff and landing, the nose of the plane actually flipped up and down. And extra special paint had to be developed for the exterior to withstand the immense heat from air friction. The engineering wizardry was incredible when you also consider that, at the time, there were some televisions still in black and white. Over the next few decades, flying slowly became less glamorous. Pan Am's air hostesses were out, and passengers in pajamas were in. For most people, flying became more cramped and routine. Yet Concorde never lost its shine. How could it, when it was so darn expensive? Only the financially gifted could enjoy its French gourmet dinners and champagne. But at nearly $12,000 for a round-trip ticket, you better be getting some garlic snails instead of airline peanuts. Riding on Concorde was the height of success, and many passengers dreamed of trying it at least once in their life. But sooner or later, its flaws would catch up with it. For starters, the noise pollution and shockwaves from supersonic flight meant the only realistic paths were over the ocean. Any long-distance flight over land would probably have had to fund all of the broken windows in the buildings below. Concorde was too expensive, even in theory. And that's before factoring in the insane fuel costs or ticket economics. Only 120 passengers could be inside, so if a journey wasn't fully booked, then your revenue was shakier than a weather balloon during hurricane season. Simply hiring a team capable enough to fly and maintain the thing meant it was costing the airline a premium before the plane was even in the air. In fact, Air France had to keep a spare plane in New York in case anything went wrong with the first one. So now, they had to buy and maintain two Concords, but were only making money on one. Then, as the 90s got underway, fears about destruction of the ozone layer added environmental concerns. Analysts were worried that if supersonic flight really did become the next big thing, then any future environmental policies would be catastrophic for the industry. But all of that still wasn't enough to stop Concorde. It was ultimately two back-to-back -back disasters that put an end to this legendary plane. On July 25, 2000, Air France Flight 4590 punctured a tire while taking off on the runway. The debris from the tire ended up puncturing the fuel tank, which led to an external fire and the pilots losing control of the plane while in the air. All 109 people on board, plus four on the ground, perished when it crashed into a nearby hotel shortly after takeoff. Though this was the only fatal disaster in Concorde's history, it greatly affected its reputation for safety and technology, especially when it became known how the causes of the accident were specific to Concorde's design. Then, a year later, 9-11 happened, and airline demand dropped significantly. 
Concord was already struggling by then, and this seemed to be the final blow to its future. With all of the elements acting against it, there was only one thing to do. Retire the most incredible piece of technology that aerospace had ever seen. On October 24, 2003, reporters and television news teams gathered to record its final flight across the Atlantic. Tickets for Concorde's last ever voyage went for absurd amounts, and celebrities piled into the comfy chairs for its last hoorah. And what a hoorah it was! Concorde was created during the space race, flew through the digital revolution, and landed on the cusp of the information age. When Concorde touched down on October 24, 2003, it was the end of an era. Supersonic flight had come and gone in the blink of an eye. The sight of its majestic slender frame slicing across the stratosphere is missed by those lucky enough to have ever glimpsed it. Though they likely don't miss the sound, not even a bit. Thanks for watching, and now for our first ever giveaway! To celebrate the start of our channel, we're giving away this mini replica Concorde. All you need to do is like the video and comment what you think of Concorde's story. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one!